Hello there. To the new faces, welcome. To the old faces, welcome back. This is the subject of today's build. All the pertinent components may be found down in the description, as well as a link to the Saber Builders Academy on Facebook, so if you need additional help building this, you can find it there. Any critique and comments or questions are always welcome, so leave them down below if you have them. Without further ado, let's get started. All right, so at this point, I've chosen my soundboard, I've read its manual, and I have picked and purchased my other parts according to my desired build. Before I start installing, I'm just going to make sure that I have all my necessary components present. I have the saber hilt here, and this particular hilt comes with tactile switches. There's the holder for the NeoPixel PCB connector. There's the connector itself. Next, we have the connector lens cover, the 2.1 millimeter recharge port, our properly selected 18650 lithium ion battery, this in-hilt style LED module and its lens, which is just an alternative to the NeoPixel that I'll also be demonstrating. The speaker of choice, a 3D print of the hilt specific chassis, optional accent LEDs to create accent lighting in the hilt. I've opted to leave them out of my build. The heart of the build, which is a Golden Harvest V3 soundboard, the tactile switches that came with the hilt, along with the supplied 3D printed holders, a kill key of my own making. I'll be linking to a video on how to make these, but either way, you need a really slim one to fit into this hilt. Various gauges of wire. Oh, and resistors, properly calculated, of course, for in-hilt or non-NeoPixel LEDs. All right, to get started, I'll be lightly greasing the threads of the hilt. This helps prevent damage to the threads, like galling or cross-threading, while also keeping the annoying squeaking noises at bay. Now I'm removing the heatsink module that also houses the switches. There are the switch plungers as well. To put them back in, just extend a finger into the hilt and manipulate them into place. You'll get the hang of it after a couple of tries. All right, onto the chassis. It is two parts printed as one, so what we need to do is separate them. I'm carefully cutting each of the connecting bits until the halves are free. This is a good time to exercise caution so as not to cut yourself or cut the wrong part of the chassis. You can see that eventually those two pieces will be put together like so. Now I'm just trimming off the remnants of the connecting pieces, which is especially necessary near the heatsink side for fitment reasons. It's apparent that the chassis needs some modification. Deepening and widening the countersink holes does the trick. Battery fitment looks good. Now moving on to the recharge port. It's pretty clear we'll need some shims to prevent interference with the hilt, but we'll come back to that. The NeoPixel connector PCB fits nicely into the provided holder, and the lens fits well on top of that. But the plastic holder is nowhere near the right size to fit into the heatsink, so let's trim it. And then sand for good measure. Also, I apparently was not recording when I checked fitment again, but I swear it works now. This is just a little test to see what it's like routing the wire. It's a little fiddly, but it could have been worse. Checking board fitment as well. And it's like a glove. Time to connect the two parts of the chassis. The adhesive I'm using here is just standard model glue. E6000 or another epoxy would work as well. After cleaning up the squeeze out, I applied pressure to keep the halves together while the glue set. My chassis is white because I wanted to color it with dye. The first coat I'm applying is a mahogany leather dye. I opt to use cloth, as it carries more dye than a brush, and it applies it more liberally. In the second stage, I'm applying a black dye over the mahogany. You'll notice that I'm acting like some weirdo using that wood skewer. Believe it or not, there is a technique I'm trying to achieve with it. The skewer doesn't quite reach into corners, nooks, and crannies as easily as a brush or a cloth would. I find it helpful in achieving a corrosion peeking through the chassis type of finish. Then I finish up the thirsty or lonely spots with a q-tip. Now the chassis has had time to dry, I'll be adding some brass accent rods to help complete the look. This is a bit tedious in terms of fitment, but it looks nice when it's done. Now to fix places that the die didn't take. I start by lightly sanding each of them. After that, it's just a matter of reapplication.
This two-part epoxy mixed with a black dye is going to cover some terminations, gaps, and ugly spots, and hopefully blend well with the final finish. With the epoxy dry, I'm very lightly hitting the chassis with a Scotch-Brite pad, followed by rubbing graphite powder into the chassis, and then top coating with a clear sealer. This gives an aged metallic look, but has a little high gloss for my taste in the end, so I knocked back a little bit of that shine, both on the chassis and in the kitchen behind the scenes. Onward to the heatsink module. So I'm removing the switches, their holders, and the nylon set screws in order to prep for finishing. Once again, I'm using an abrasive pad to scour the surface. That combined with the alcohol and gloves keeps oils off of the surface and allows for a good reaction with the aluminum black. Having reached my desired level of coverage and allowed all the liquid to dry, I'm going to create a final look to complement the rest of the chassis. At this point, I felt I was missing one key little greebly, so I dug through my treasure trove of garbage for just the right screw. Perfect. Let's do one more fitment check before the electronics install. It's a little bit snug now with the finish build up, but it does work. In this build, I chose to utilize a TCS WOW speaker. There are a lot of other options out there that are way less finicky, but this particular speaker is meant to be front mounted with support against its rim, hence the two foam rings with adhesive backing that you can see on the speaker. When unsupported in that manner, these speakers tend to not sound as good nor last as long. Basically, they vibrate themselves to death. What I discovered after testing the fit several times is that one of the two foam rings can be removed to achieve a snug fit inside the pummel. Next up, wiring diagrams. And I cannot stress enough how helpful and important these are. First scenario is for an in-hill tri installation. I've clearly drawn and labeled all the components so you can copy if you like. However, this is not the only way to wire these installs. Also, the components are not drawn to scale. The speaker is pretty straightforward, but you may be wondering, do speakers have a polarity? Yeah, they do, but it's not always indicated on the speakers. Is it absolutely necessary to wire the negative and positive terminals to the negative and positive pads respectively? Not usually, and in this case, no. So if you're following along with your own build, don't worry about it now. Now the switches, we can bridge a connection between the switch legs on one leg a piece. This allows for running one wire back to ground and save space, time, and resources in the install. Of the two remaining legs, one has to go to power and the other to auxiliary on the board. Our first power connection here is between the positive battery terminal and the appropriate terminal on the recharge port. Then we need to connect that to the board. Starting at the battery positive pad, we can tie in wherever makes sense within the confines of our hilt space. Anywhere between or at these terminals will suffice. Our final positive power connection comes from the LED module and can tie in wherever makes the most sense. In order to achieve this single wire run, I must bridge the positive pads as well as using a larger gauge wire. I'll be adding wire gauges to the diagram after I'm finished, so just bear with me. There's a recharge port to battery negative connection, followed by a recharge port to the board negative, and now just the LED pad connections. Each diode's negative terminal to its respective pad. Don't forget to add your properly calculated resistors in line behind each diode that needs one. As you can see, I'm jumping over that wire there. The two LEDs are not connected. And here's the handy labeling of appropriate wire gauges. All right, now it's NeoPixel time. This diagram will be similar in some aspects, but a bit different for the NeoPixel connector. This particular connector has accent LEDs incorporated and can be wired in more than one fashion. The manual for the connector gives you the different options. I'll be showing one of those options. Let's start with that component first. Initially, I'm making the bridges for my chosen configuration. First, I'm bridging the blade detection pad with this negative pad. Note that the negative pads and positive pads are internally connected on this PCB. Now I'm bridging the jumper pads. The GHV3 board has a built-in resistor for the data line, so rather than adding one to the R2 pads, 
I'm simply bridging them as well. Let's jump to the switches. And you know the drill here from the last diagram. Same goes for these initial power connections, but this time bridging the positive pads is unnecessary as they are internally connected on this PCB. The speaker is also the same as before. Then we need to bridge the LED pads 1, 2, and 3 and make a connection from that bridge to a negative pad on the connector. Last but not least, a connection from the strip pad to the data pad. And here are the appropriate wire gauges. So let's get installing. I'm going to trim up the recharge port legs, not only to keep them away from the soundboard, but also to keep the install looking tidier. I won't show it with every single component, but be assured that I am pre-tinning nearly everything. That and adding flux before soldering makes for a much smoother experience and cleaner joints. Always remove the SD card when you're soldering, otherwise you could melt or damage it. Here you should notice that I am clamping on an empty portion of the board so as not to damage components or connections. Oh, and wiping pads down with alcohol can help solder stick better initially. Right along with that, apply a little bit of flux as well. It is not obligatory to cover the entire pad with solder. I just like the way that they look. It definitely makes connections easier though. You can see that shiny residue left over in between the pads and on top of the solder. And that's from the flux, both in the solder itself and the paste that I added. Alcohol is your friend here. Not only does it look tacky to leave that flux residue, but it can also cause accidental bridges that might ruin your electronics. So just clean it off, that's all I'm saying. Just like on our diagram, we're making some bridges on this PCB. First up, the blade ID pad to the negative pad. The closest one makes the most sense. Then the R2 resistor pads. And then the jumper pads. Bridges like these can be tricky. The main thing is just to have patience and get in some repetition before working on the real thing. Next, I'm pre-tinning the data pad. Then I go back to clean it up. And in my haste, I make a small whoopsie. I left it in because it's a good opportunity to show how to handle such a situation. What we have is an accidental solder bridge between the R2 resistor pads and the D2 data pad. These are the kind of things that can wreck your electronics, and that's why it's crucial to double check all your connections before powering things up for the first time. All we need to do is separate or remove the unwanted bridge, and the solution is to reheat the solder and move it with a soft object that won't collect the solder. The best choice for the tool, a toothpick. Just like that, the problem is solved. Two of these switch legs are unnecessary, so I'm opting to get rid of them as they only offer more opportunity for electrical shorts. And a little more pre-tinning action for your viewing pleasure. Pop these guys back in their holders and that's that. For those who are following along and are a little bit leery of soldering directly to batteries, don't be. It's not some monumental task. First, with the clean terminals, apply some flux. With your iron bumped from the 300 to 350 degrees Celsius range up to 400 degrees Celsius, tin its tip, briefly apply it to the battery. On a negative terminal like this one, soldering is typically very easy. If your solder doesn't take well within a few seconds, remove the iron, allow the battery to cool, and then try it again. The other end, the positive terminal, may prove a little bit more difficult, especially if it has a button top like this battery does. Yes, you can buy flat tops. This is just what I happen to have on hand, and I'm going to show you how to deal with it. After a couple of attempts to solder, it just doesn't want to take, so rather than waste my time fooling with that, let's just remove it. First, I'll trim back the heat shrink on the exterior of the battery. Then I'll remove this top cover, saving it to glue back on later. After that, I pry up an edge of the button top, and tear it off. Underneath is a surface that we can solder to. I left this pre-tinning unedited so you can see that it took me roughly nine seconds to get good adhesion. I really don't recommend applying heat for much longer than that at one time. However, I've done this a fair amount and I felt comfortable with it. Always store batteries separated in non-conductive containers, not on your tabletop. Try Cree step number one. You pretend there isn't already solder on these pads and that I am pre-tinning them for the first time ever. <laughs> now I'm prepping some wires. The goal at this point is just to make sure that all of our components work before putting them into the chassis. For this electronics test, we'll be doing a tri cree configuration. I'm starting out with the speaker and now the switches. Please excuse my forgetfulness. I should have two wires here. That's more like it. I missed that part somehow, but all I did was use two short wires to bridge the positive pads. 
This is all just as simple as taking your time and following your wired diagram. You can see I have a kill key inserted in the recharge port. I highly recommend that you have one in while soldering. It can reduce the likelihood of unwanted accidents. You'll notice a lot of my joints are pretty damn ugly. This is because they are temporary and I'm not going to waste my time prettying them up. Alright, everything is wired up and ready to test, but what you need to know is that behind the scenes, I have double checked every component and connection. There's no errant solder or other conductive material on the components. They are all free from flux residue, and the wiring is accurate to my diagram. Only, only when these things have been confirmed should you put power to your board. Oh, and that flashing means that the SD card is not inserted. There we go. That's more like it. Now we'll desolder a few connections and test our NeoPixel configuration. With all the appropriate connections made, I'm once again checking for bridges, flux, or debris where they don't belong. Apparently, I didn't get the test footage here, but you can see my Neo accents fire up without the SD in. If you ever install using like colors or the same color for all of your wire insulation, make sure you label the wires with tape or trim them to different lengths and denote those lengths on your wiring diagram or have some way of letting yourself know which wire goes to which component and which pad on which component or which terminal. Then just double check all of them with continuity or the resistor setting on your multimeter once they're installed. Initially, when cutting wire, I get it to within the realm of the appropriate length and then I trim the excess later. Let's solder up this connector. You'll notice that each of these wires incorporates a 90 degree bend to bring them together in the center of the connector. This is tidier and it makes for easier routing later. I now have my positive and negative wires soldered as well as my data connection made. Like always, clean up that board. All right, let's fit this bad boy up. There's that cleaner wire feed I was alluding to earlier. Make sure that the connector bottoms out and then snug up each of the set screws. With that complete, I'll move on to the switches. Tactile switches are easily melted and ruined because of their plastic bodies. So apply heat for as little time as possible. That's the goal with these little buggers. And I tend to throw heat shrink on all possible joints. You may see me skip one here and there, but it's a good practice in general. Right now, I'm stripping a wire in the middle to avoid cutting it and having two parts. This is absolutely not necessary. Two wires can accomplish the same goal. This is just tidier in my opinion, but it's definitely more difficult. If you do it, don't cut your strands. Now to install the switches and make the final connection between them for the shared or common ground. Now it's time to make my notes. For me, the only wires I feel likely to confuse are the switches. So those are the ones I'm going to be making notes on. However, making thorough notes never hurts. So do what makes sense for you. Here I'm noting which switch is aux and which is power. Here's the shimming I mentioned earlier. I'm just using rings from other power jacks that I've had because they aren't always needed. In this case though, they'll be keeping the recharge port at a proper height in the chassis. And you can definitely see why a thin top is necessary on the kill key. The first connection on the recharge port is for the negative pad on the board. Now I'm threading my battery wire down the chassis. Okay. 
and I'll solder that up as well. Next, I'm trimming the battery negative wire. And attaching that to the battery negative terminal, as well as the appropriate recharge port terminal. Reminder, your kill key should still be in. There's the battery to positive recharge port connection, and here's where it makes sense to tie it into the NeoPixel connector positive. This is where you need to be attentive and double check yourself. Use a multimeter, your eyes, your notes, whatever but be absolutely sure you have the correct polarity to your connector. Or when you fire it up, you're gonna fry any NeoPixel lights that are connected. This is easy to get right so long as you're paying attention. Next up, lots of tedious wire routing. And I covered that wire to avoid mishaps of the electrical variety. Now to connect things to the board. It's as easy as trimming to length and making connections. There's the switch to ground. That's the auxiliary switch. There's the power switch. Moving on, we've got our data lead. This is the battery positive connection between the recharge port and the board. That one is the battery negative. And then this one to the bridge pads is the NeoPixel connector negative lead. And finally the speaker. Keep heat application short here, just like with the switches because there's a lot of plastic. One final component check and cleaning before the moment of truth. Don't be overly eager. Use your noggin before pulling that kill key. If you notice an error right now, you save yourself a lot of frustration later. Okay, SD card goes back in, and this is it. This is the best part of every build, hands down. Balance. Now that I know things function, I'm going to secure the speaker and the board with a little E6000. Don't go overboard on this stuff. A little goes a long way. And that really goes for any adhesive. Also, keep your application specific in placement as well as tidy. Sometimes you forget a little bit of the fitment details, and I am guilty this time around. But luckily it's an easy fix. I did not fix the switches in place within their printed holders, and that in turn interferes with installation and function. So a little E6000 and gentle clamping in place to set them does the job. Do not get adhesive inside of the switches near the button. They'll likely lock up and fail. So with the install steps completed, in addition to a hilt, we now have a fully removable chassis, complete with electronics. Placing the chassis in the hilt is pretty straightforward. Simply remove the emitter and the pommel. With the switch plungers or buttons in place, slide the chassis into the hilt, being sure to line up the tactile switch slot with the plungers. Once fully seated, gently snug the retention screw and replace the pommel and the emitter. 
At this point, a blade or a blade plug may be inserted, tightening the corresponding set screw. And the saber is functional. Charging simply requires the pommel to be removed and the chassis set screw loosened. Then the chassis may be slid out to reveal the recharge port. The SD card is also accessible in this manner to update settings or saber sounds. I hope you found this video entertaining or enlightening. If so, let me know with a like or a comment. Thanks for watching everyone.